From the Homestead Studios in Santa Clarita, California, it's just the tip stirs with Melissa Morgan. Talk your shit by <laughs> your lip. Today, featuring a fascinating discussion on forensic pathology with doctors Nicole Kroom and Jordan Taylor, host of the podcast Dead Men Do Tell Tales. Remember, if you've got a tip about anything, tell us about it by calling the Tipster hotline at 832-TIPSTER. That's 832-847-7837, or send an email to jttipsters at gmail.com. And now here's your host, starting her online Christmas shopping early by selling out every item in the L.A. County Coroner's Gift Shop, Melissa Morgan. (laughs) More cowbell. I love everything from the L.A. County Coroner's Gift Shop um, online site. I love it. They used to have an actual small section in the Coroner's Building, which is a beautiful old building in, um, is that called downtown L.A.? It's That's it's like, it's just near downtown. Nor- it's on near, Mission Road. It's on yeah, North, yeah, Mission yeah. Road. North Mission Road. Yeah, 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 North Mission Road. Uh, but yeah. I've been in the actual gift shop several times physically in there. And I, I know. I just <laughs> your credit card bills are crying. I went for one for one of your big birthdays. Oh, I that's went, right, my fortieth. I went and I I raided them and I got you, you a bunch of stuff you from did. there. You, I still have the uh, skull that opens up and holds business cards on my desk. Oh, really? It's right here. Yeah. Oh, see, there right you here. go. Absolutely. I think you've got the the little uh, coffin purse up on us uh, somewhere here too. It's yeah. it's on the shelf. I'm I'm about three feet from it. Okay. It's right here on my shelf in my room. Yeah. All right. Quite a few wonderful things from the LA County Corners gift shop. So Wow. Yeah, it's a it's a lovely uh, place to go shopping. It's the most wonderful time <laughs> of the year. You're out of your goddamn mind. Is yes, what your sir. Problem is. I am, and it is a good place to shop for people like me who are murder nerds, which you will find out um, with our guests in this episode. Yes, one but... of the reasons I I know I'm getting to it. I, okay, I just I'm just all excited. Reason, I know I'm so I'm excited too. Yeah. But you will find out one of the podcasts I have discovered during my murder nerd journey and it is a wonderful one and our guests are exemplary humans who are fascinating and fun and wonderful in the future of forensic medicine but before we get to that we have you my beautiful tipsters (laughs) and i'm gonna cry she's happy folks i'm telling you she's happy yeah these are happy tears but you beautiful tipsters sharing the episodes getting the word out there you've made a difference Uh, Not long after episode 147 aired, Detective Cox was contacted on the Bill and Peggy Stevenson case by a third party tipster who has information that they believe only the killer or killers would know. And they are following that up really hard. And they have released a a press release today in all of their social media and it is um, being carried on a lot of the stations in the Cincinnati area because the family has put together a $50,000 reward. And I was unaware of how those things worked until this case. I assumed if you had a reward offer, you made the offer, but I did not know that you had to prove that you have those funds and you put them in an escrow account. Oh, right. Yeah, that makes sense. So it's, yeah, it's a, it's a, you know, above board uh, thing. It isn't just like I'm offering you a million dollars if you, you know, don't play your kazoo for five minutes. It's actually something you have to prove that you have. So the family has gotten $50,000 together for a reward and you can absolutely contact Detective Cox at the Boone County Sheriff's Office at 859-334-8496 or toll free at 844-210-1111. And you can even send an email if that's easier for you at stevensontip at boonecountykentucky.org. And Stevenson is spelled S-T-E-P-H-E-N-S-O-N. T-I-P at BooneCountyKentucky.org. Boone County is B-O-O-N-E C-O-U-N-T-Y-K-Y dot org. So you can get in touch with Detective Cox and the Boone County Sheriff's Department in any way that is comfortable for you. They are even open to you 
using a burner phone if you feel like you are uncomfortable having your phone traced and or a caller ID. And it's, I mean, I just am overwhelmed at their stick and not letting this nine-year-old case become cold. It may be old in their words, but it's not ever cold. Right. And, and, and the tipsters who listen to this podcast, this is, this is proof right here that you can make a difference. Somebody heard the interview with Detective Cox called and, um, there's now a lead. There's now a real lead. Yeah. And you know, it's, it's, uh, if you think that, you know, calling and, and, and listening to these, to these podcasts, not just ours, but any of these podcasts that you maybe knowing something, something nagging you in the back of your head. Um, and you just think, ah, it's nothing. It's not nothing. It's never nothing. And you right. should always go with your gut and, and call it in. Yeah. Call it in, email it in, whatever you are comfortable doing. And I just, I have to say thank you to the tipsters. You know, without you, there's no us. And without you, there's no information like this that comes to law enforcement when they have been working on something for nine years and have had some great tips. But as Detective Cox likes to say, there's never been the aha moment. So I'm really hoping that we are closing in on the aha moment and that whoever, what wonderful ears this podcast fell on that felt the desire to contact the detective, we are, we are so grateful for you. And yeah, I'm just, I'm overwhelmed, uh, overjoyed and a little numb and really hoping that this turns into something that's really going to help bring the Stevenson's some peace. We know there's no such thing as closure, but the Stevenson kids and grandkids deserve peace. They, they need some peace in their lives. So hopefully that's going to happen. And I'm, I'm just grateful to you tipsters. So our guests this episode are phenomenal girls that I found in my search for good podcasts, which there are not a lot of. There are a lot of them in different genres, of course. There's over a million different unique podcasts at this point in our in our lifetimes. And I listen to maybe five, uh, maybe 10. But I, you know, I tend to like ones that are a specific thing, like true crime. <laughs> but I also like not just the stories of the cases, but the people who you know, are involved and who handle the cases and bring um, answers to families. So when people are telling me, you know, gosh, I'm so proud of you. I'm like, look, I'm a bitch with a microphone. I didn't do anything. I talked about the case and, and I'm going to just, <laughs> and the detective, you did do hey, something. No, stop. All look, right. I did. I, I host a podcast. That's what I've done. So I'm again, grateful for those of you who listen and those of you who have information and, and are, you know, comfortable telling it. But these girls are in the residency part of their education to become forensic pathologists. And they are fascinating girls. They're these young girls who I thought had known each other for a very long time and had met three years ago, started talking at, at a, um, you know, a picnic in their internship and their you know, medical school part of the pathology part. And, you know, one of them was like, wouldn't it be great if we had a, if there was a podcast that can answer some questions. And there are other pathology podcasts, I will be honest with you, not a lot, but a few, and they're not really that interesting. And there, there's a lot of, you know, really good kind of technical podcasts out there. But the fact that Jordan and Nicole have such a way of explaining things. You can tell they're both brilliant and neither of them have any pretense. They just explain things in cases and what happens to the body and things they've seen and worked on in a way that everyone can get it. And I don't mean they, you know, pander to the lowest common denominator. They just talk like real people and they are just real people who are going through this fascinating journey in their life. And they are the future because they are 
you know, they want to specialize in death investigation. They want to be pathologists who specifically work on death investigations. And that's just, you know, a remarkable thing. I feel I feel somewhat more relieved about the future when I know the death investigation are going to be in hands like Jordan's and Nicole's. And they're just interesting, funny, you know, smart, wonderful girls who host this podcast called Dead Men Do Tell Tales. And we will have information about that podcast in our show notes. But I know you're going to enjoy this interview with Jordan and Nicole. We are really blessed today to have with us via Zoom, even though I can't see them. I know they're there. I saw them for a second. The hosts of Dead Men Do Tell Tales, Jordan and Nicole. And I am madly in love with these girls. I've talked about their podcast before, but getting to talk to them is like, (laughs) I'm just like, I'm overjoyed and rubbing (laughs) my hands together like a weirdo. Welcome, you two. Thank you for being here. Thank you for having us. This yeah. is awesome. We're really excited to be on your show. I'm so happy because I I started, you know, looking around at podcasts that were more uh, for people in specific industries. And I found a lot of like law enforcement um, podcasts that I enjoy and a couple of uh, crime scene, you know, podcasts that were a little dry. And then I found you two and just was like, oh. <gasps> I love them so much. So I sit and wait for every episode to come out. I was really excited about today's. um, And and I will tell you my favorite episode when we get to it. But tell us a little bit about each of you. And I know you're, I think you're both in your residency program at this time, right? Yes. Okay. So yeah, you can go, whoever wants to go first. Jordan, if you want to go first, tell us a little bit about you and how you got into this field. Yeah. So I'm Jordan. Um, I'm originally from Connecticut and Kind of my intro to the field was a mixture of pop culture, as everybody has seen <laughs> all of the millions of shows out there about forensics and forensic pathology and crime scene stuff. Um, but I also had the added benefit of my grandfather is actually a pathologist. Wow. And he you know, graduated med school back in the 50s. So very old school pathologist. But back then, they kind of were you know, a master of all trades. So mm. while he did the normal run-of-the-mill pathology with like tissue diagnosis and lab medicine. He also would sometimes do forensic pathology and be on call for cases that would come up. So Ah. I grew up with a story of like, yeah, so like the story that I always hear about was when my mom was sitting at dinner and at like 6 p.m. the phone would ring and my grandfather would be like, God damn it, don't they know not to get shot during dinner? Um, and he would, <laughs> How dare they? <laughs> and he, <laughs> I know, exactly. Um, and this is in Waterbury, Connecticut, which is um, one of the quote-unquote cities in Connecticut, uh, you know, <laughs> less populated than most cities that people normally. Uh, so I was uh, lucky to grow up with him as an influence. Um, and then I, you know, kind of went through school trying to, you know, keep my mind open, but I kept going back to pathology and forensic pathology, and it never quite left my system. And now Nicole and I are both in our fourth year of residency at UCSF, and next year we'll be going to Seattle for Forensic Pathology Fellowship. Oh, wow. And next year starts in July 2021. Yeah, Yeah, The, the med school residency cycle is a weird thing. Like our year is the beginning of July, July 1st. That is interesting. Okay, so Nicole, how did you stumble into this? Yeah, so I have always been fascinated by the human body, like what makes us tick and what makes us stop ticking. Mm -hmm. Um, So when I was a senior in high school, we had to do a senior project and I chose to do mine on the CSI effect and we had to do some sort of field work for that project. And my mom had a connection to a deputy coroner and so she was able to set up a shadowing day for me at the San Joaquin County Sheriff Coroner's office. So I went in and I was working with um, one of the deputy coroners and then he said, oh, well, if you're interested in forensic pathology, our chief medical examiner is here and he'd probably be more than happy to talk to you. Um, So I talked with him and he said that anytime I wanted to come in and shadow him specifically, I could. So whenever I was home on break from then on, um, from undergrad, I would go in and I would work with him And uh, similar to Jordan, I try to keep an open mind going through undergrad and medical school, but nothing uh, drew my interest as much as forensic pathology has and continues to do. 
Okay, so I'm going to explain how I think both of you may be my daughters, even though I don't remember having children. <laughs> um, let's just say I've been fascinated by the, you know, I, I love the, the term death investigation. Um, I think that's, you know, fascinating. I've never heard of it really called that, but that's what it is. And I've been fascinated by that and the body for a very long time since I was a kid. So finding your podcast was like um, a oasis in the desert of, you know, boring, dry podcasts. And then I found you guys and I was like, oh, I love these girls. They're so smart and funny and personable and um, respectful of each other. And I am deeply in love with Nicole's uh, desire to become the queen of trivia because (laughs) I love trivia. And that's one of the things that is even more fascinating to me about your podcast is some of the things you, you know and talk about and research are, you know, like they break open my mind. And and when you said earlier that you wanted to keep open minds in med school about which way to go, but you were both kind of led to, you know, forensic pathology, you, you, your information on your podcast, and I know, and I'm just going to use this term, and I don't care if people are offended, but I'm a total murder nerd. And, (laughs) but I also, you know, love the human body and before and after um, we, you know, shuffle off our mortal coil. And it's fascinating totally fascinating that this is your, you know, your focus that you, that you're both working on and that you both wanted to do this podcast. So tell me how you met and how you decided to do this podcast. You must have seen um, a need for people in your industry to have, you know, something to listen to that wasn't just like stats and figures and bullshit. Yeah. So <laughs> we, we didn't know each other before residency started three years ago now yeah yeah um so we met at like a social gathering before residency started i had gone to medical school at ucsf so i was the most familiar with the city out of everybody that was joining the program so i set up a social gathering and that's where we first met but we didn't really have like a good conversation with each other until our orientation picnic and we just hit it off super well seriously it felt like we had known each (laughs) other for years yeah that's pretty much exactly (laughs) it does Um, it does seem like you have you know like you were sisters or something i wasn't sure how (laughs) long you'd known each other but that's even more interesting now to know it's only been three years because you do seem like you have a a symbiosis where you you know complete each other's sentences and it's (laughs) fascinating listening to you Yeah, like Nicole said, it was just like we met and it was like between having similar outlooks in life and career goals and interests and it just, I don't know, it just works. Everything meshed really well. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah, I I love the, the stories of how you have been interested. I always feel like the people that are the best at what they do kind of know what they want to do fairly young. Like they may have just like come into the world knowing kind of there's an inner knowing, you know, like when we're kids, everybody wants to be a doctor or a nurse or a veterinarian or a pilot. But, you know, when you get a little older, you change, you know, your ideas and then you kind of know. I feel like we know what we want to do. And granted, we can always change our minds as we get older. There's no hard and fast rules. But I do think that people that are the best at what they do, it isn't like a late in life kind of thing. I mean, here, you know, we can talk Georgia O'Keeffe, but still, I feel like it's mostly people who know what they want to do. And you can tell that you both kind of knew what you wanted to do early on. And I will tell you, I am infinitely jealous of both of your beautiful brains because you're living my best life if I had (laughs) any idea how to even pass a biology class, which I is just not something I'm good at. But I am fascinated by by the body. And I have to say, I, I was listening to another podcast that was not nearly as interesting as yours. But one of the guests said something fascinating, which was pathology is the foundation of all medicine. It, it is. Yep. That's amazing to hear that. And I guess what that means is that the doctors of your really couldn't, you know, you can't like experiment on people that are alive because they may not stay that way. But after they've passed, you can, you know, open them up and look. And it's it's very interesting to me that, you know, autopsies, pathology hasn't changed all that much in the last 
hundred years other well, than, tells, you know, technical stuff. But yeah. I think it tells you a lot that really a lot of medicine didn't progress until it started being okay to do autopsies. Like there was a certain point in time when it wasn't morally okay to do an autopsy and then we started doing autopsies we started learning where everything actually was in the human body and how it was connected and what was in there yeah and that's really when medicine started so really if you think of autopsy as really like your first thing that you do in med school usually is an autopsy but autopsy is very firmly in the realm of pathology so yeah it's it's study fascinating of both normal and disease so right you know, Right. have a base like your first classes in med school are on normal and in pathology you really need to know your normal before you can go into your abnormal oh right that makes that makes perfect sense i will tell you what i know about you know anatomy i and i like to think i'm you know a big badass and i'm not but what i know i you know i'm i'm also a yoga instructor and i have been for a long time i've been practicing yoga for 21 years and teaching for 16 and one of the f the most fascinating things to me are the anatomy type classes you have to learn you know typically on people that are alive because most people <laughs> most people that have passed on don't take yoga but i did take most. you know most of them i mean it's you know we can debate that too but um <laughs> one of my favorite like weekend workshops was from a man named Gil Headley who travels around and and teaches these workshops now like you know via um you know like a big screen <laughs> does it on like a big screen and now he does it virtually but he has a uh, he's part of a teaching hospital in Broward County Florida and he you know tries to get people to donate the, their body to him and and it and he has you know several people and he names them all he gives them these beautiful names like one of the women is named Joy, like that's not her name, but he was just so overjoyed that she donated her body after after her death that he calls her Joy. I mean, he you know give he attributes you know things to them. And what what was like one of those things that he taught us that was so fascinating? He's very fascinated by fascia, which if you teach yoga, you know you, you're interested in that. But it was when you when you said that you know opening up bodies was maybe, you know, like a sacred thing. And, but Gil teaches things so beautifully, like he had a body on the table and left to go to the hospital cafeteria and came back and the fascia had turned golden and it was crunchy and he didn't know why. And then something else distracted him and he came back and it had happened again after he'd scraped that part off. And he figured out it was because the overhead light was so bright. Mm -hmm. oh. It had actually like... Yep. Cooked, dries it out pretty cooked quickly. the fascia yeah I, I, those are the pieces of information that it's like oh i mean it's so fascinating to me so this must be something that you that you both encounter if not on a daily basis probably weekly learning you know and i bet every every autopsy is different like every person is different we're all unique so so we know how you met and we know how you became focused on this so how did you decide to do this podcast? So as Nicole said, we the first time we really got to know each other well was going to the orientation picnic our first year. And was it our second year? Nicole and I were walking to the orientation picnic for the second year. So like the orientation picnic is when all four years get together and meet everybody. And we were walking to this picnic from Nicole's place and we were talking about various podcasts and we were talking about my favorite murder which is of course a very well known you know t tell each other a murder story <laughs> and we were talking about how they do a really good job going into the details talking about the victims talking about the detectives talking about investigation but a lot of the times when they start to go into the biology and the science of it and the medicine they understandably don't really know what's exactly happening because they don't have the education behind that which is legitimate and so we kind of jokingly at the time were like why don't we do a podcast on that part of it well why don't we do a podcast on the forensic pathology and teach people both you know the lay person and maybe people that know a little bit more about medicine about what forensic pathology is and what this adds to those murder stories that many podcasts at this point tell each other about absolutely 
Yeah, yeah that's what you d- did see a niche and filled it, which is great. And it first started off as like, you know, haha, let's maybe do this. Yeah. And then Nicole sent me an email that was like, what about this cover art? <laughs> and she just started fiddling on our computer and threw some stuff together and we kind of threw names back and forth and then she bought a Squarespace website <laughs> <laughs> and it just kind of slowly but surely um, evolved into all right I guess we're renting equipment and yeah. <laughs> I guess we're gonna record an episode and we've been going for over a year yeah which is crazy. yeah <laughs> Yeah, you have. It's I mean, it's it's amazing and wonderful. When I found, you know, the backlog of episodes, I became even more more interested. And I know I didn't want to say this like so soon, but I'm just going to have to tell you my favorite episode is the Christmas episode <laughs> because you it was a fun one. Oh, was my fun. gosh. It was fun. But you you alternately schooled me and broke my heart because I really wanted there to be a whole lot of people who died in chimneys. <laughs> I wanted that to be, you know, I grew up watching, you know, Gremlins and, um, you know, Phoebe Kate's dad died wearing a Santa suit and they didn't know he was dead in the chimney until he started to smell. Mm. And then you're telling me that, you know, chimneys aren't like straight up and down. They usually have a a bend. Like sometimes it can be a 90 degree angle. And I was like, no, you're crushing my dreams. (laughs) But it was so fascinating hearing about the the robbery in Northern California where someone (laughs) tried to steal the tips from the bar that were hanging in the stockings. And I wanted so desperately to email you and tell you about um, a person in, I think it was in, in Southern California, she, and she was a doctor, and uh, she, her boyfriend had broken up with her and moved on, but she had not, and she tried to break into his home, which, by the way, I think was for sale, and he wasn't even there. Yeah, and, he was gone. Yeah, I yeah. Reading you that do story that story for that episode. I just remember her, the picture of the fireman and the police, and her legs sticking out of the top, and she was wearing shorts, and I was like, "Who wears shorts to go down a chimney?" <laughs> <laughs> Don't wear your dolphin shorts. Wear some, you know, wear some like. Well, if you're in Southern California, I can imagine you won't want to wear anything but shorts. <laughs> yeah, I guess that's true. <laughs> it was just so fascinating hearing. That's where um, Nicole's love of, of trivia comes in because I was like, you're killing me because I was really hoping a bunch of people had died in chimneys. And it's just, it's <laughs> kind of almost an urban legend now. It doesn't really happen all that often. Yeah, and usually. I was actually really surprised by how few cases I found when I was researching for that episode. Episode. Yeah, and it's mostly like people trying to rob people. It's like, you know, <laughs> that's the dumbest thing. It, can, you can't find another way in. Oh, my Lord. Hey, man, the Grinch did it. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> Even with that distended belly or whatever, I don't know what he had going on, like liver failure or something. Yeah, that was so, that was just one of my favorite episodes. But I also loved, and I love when you discuss pop culture things like, um, it's not Jennifer's autopsy. What's the name of it? Oh, it's, the uh, autopsy of Jane Doe. The Jane Doe. That one, the the film, and and the the things they got right and the things they got wrong. But my uh, my other favorite is when you discuss things like bones and how it's difficult to wear high heels with spikes to an you know <laughs> to a murder scene or whatever. It's like oh yeah, that's you know I because I have a background and you know I've worked in the entertainment industry, so I. I, you know, I know that side of it too, but it's so fascinating when, you know, when people who work in the industry can, you know, point a finger and go, that's not the way it happens. And, and one of the things I remember from interviewing my, my county coroner as a young person, as I wrote for a little local rag, um, he said, you know, I wish that cases could be solved in 60 minutes, like on Quincy. (laughs) that would be a great thing if they could be solved in 60 minutes so what are like your favorite types of i know this is a weird question but this is what you do how how, what are your favorite types of autopsies is it something where someone may have died of a natural death and they need that investigated or like our our murders you know is that something that really messes with you or you're you're used to it so I guess for the first part of that question, what's my favorite type of autopsy? Mm-hmm. I think my favorite is when you go in expecting one thing and then find something surprising. Uh. So like there was this one case of that I had that I did with the forensic medical examiner in San Francisco where it was a woman, she was 50-ish and she 
had been acting a little strangely, history of alcohol, um, wasn't in contact with the family for a couple of days and was found down. And when you do an autopsy, you generally do the body cavity first. And we went through and everything was totally normal. And then we went and we took out our brain and we found this huge brain tumor wow. that nobody knew about. And that was the cause of her recent mental change, not her history of alcoholism, like everybody was assuming her. Right. She didn't have any alcohol in her on tox. And it was this natural thing that the family didn't know about, nobody knew about. And it's something that you can see grossly. You don't right. need a microscope. And like, of course, we did look at it under the microscope later to figure out what kind of brain tumor it was, which I at this point, I can't remember what it was. But it was an answer for the family so right. they know and you can really give them closure and just you go in thinking one thing and it keeps telling me time and time again to not buttonhole yourself into one diagnosis before you've done the full autopsy because you never know what you're going to find that's that shows you know that yeah you, you keeping your open mind those are the people you want you know working if god forbid if something happens to your body those are the people you want working on you the people that aren't closed to any, you know, any, th any answer, keeping your mind open that it could be, I mean, that's fascinating, that twist and turn that you thought it was one thing. And then it, you know, it becomes something completely different. And I love the fact that you said you start, you started the cavities. Um, <laughs> because that reminds me of the episode where when Fluffy attacks, because animals start at the cavities too, right? They do. <laughs> I had no idea, but it makes sense. So you're kind of like animals. You're like little dogs <laughs> who are sniffing, sniffing around the cavities. And I was so fascinated by the fact that you know, animals can do if a body is left out, or if even if a body is left in the home and and not found for a while, animals can do damage that can um, mask something or even make it look like something else. And I can't remember which one of you said that animals can make it look. It can even you know resemble like a sexual assault. You know, like yeah. the bite. I guess like bite marks or something. I will tell you that in college. Um, a friend of mine, has, he and his father and his sister went on a fishing trip and left their mom at home, and she was sitting in her her easy chair crocheting, and they came back on Monday, and she had passed away sitting up in her chair, and the cat ate her ear and half her face, yeah. <laughs> which I didn't want to say anything because I can't remember which one of you said that your cat has decided that your flesh is delicious and wants to consume you. <laughs> well literally about a minute ago george was <laughs> took a swat at me and now i have a solid cut in my finger <laughs> I, 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 by the way this is and we can stop for a second i've been watching I, i've been watching the whole time melissa hasn't seen that Do yeah. you need to take a break jordan and take care of your finger I mean, oh no, no it's fine it's it's <laughs> stop I mean, bleeding the, the cat the cat george oh is, george is the name of your cat it's Nicole's. I, it's mine, oh, yeah. so, uh, and George, <laughs> George has been a kind of a mini star of the video here. Poor, poor Jordan's keep. I got keeps, the water bottle keeps, out. Keeps so trying to squirt him. He, to he, squirt he, him. He, he keeps jumping in front of the camera. And, uh, <laughs> no, but it's all right. Okay, we, we put we have a dog by the way who would eat me in a heartbeat, and um, <laughs> we put her in her crate so she thinks it's nap time every time we try to record. But yeah, she. Uh, I'm sure she'd go for all my. She goes for my cat and I'm still alive. <laughs> so if I... I know that my cat, Cole, would definitely try to eat me if I if I wasn't breathing. Oh, yeah. You know, think... you know what's interesting is they tried to pass it off that cats have those uh, sandpaper tongue and that mm. the cat was trying to wake wake my friend's mom up and just kept licking, licking her face. And I'm like, that's bullshit. The cat was hungry and ate her fucking face. <laughs> wasn't kindly licking her to wake her up. Whatever helps you sleep at night. <laughs> or not sleep at night. <laughs> yeah, whatever you tell yourself. That <laughs> so that's what I love about, uh, just one of the things I love about your podcast is that you have, you know, so many different fascinating topics that I would never think would apply to forensic pathology and how, you know, you are puzzle solvers and things like how um, nature you know, how um, storms and mother nature can affect, you know, what happens when someone dies, pathology, how, you know, being um, injured in custody, 
you know, b- having domestic abuse, um, you know, your your cat eats your face, um, you know, it's a, every episode. Yeah, every episode is so fascinating to me because I learn so much. And, and like you said, it's for people in the industry, but also for the layman, which is, I, I think it's a beautiful kind of a tightrope you walk. You know, there are sometimes things that are over my head, but for the most part, it's so relatable and understandable. And I know there's a whole lot more murder nerds like me, <laughs> you know, who lo- w- when they, you know, when they find you are going to just fall madly in love with you. So do you, I'm trying to remember, is it every week you do a new episode? We release them every two weeks. Every two weeks. Okay. So when you, um, so I'm, I was also fascinated by the amount of, you know, education you have to go through to be you. So it's like regular college, med school, your residency, and then now next year you're going to be doing your fellowship. Now, both of you are going to Seattle. Did you plan that together or it just worked out that way? It just worked out that way. <laughs> <laughs> you guys, I think, are just meant, meant to be together. I really, I really think that for sure. So it's we a, got the we got the two spots in Seattle, so they have no idea what's coming for them. <laughs> <laughs> They're going to find out the Pacific Northwest is going to catch fire. <laughs> They're going to find out what's coming their way. So it it's actually so much really fun. funny. Our interviews were the day after each other. So Jordan went up there first, and then I had a lot of travel issues <laughs> so i i it's actually statement <laughs> yeah i kind of missed like half my interview day but i got up there and they were like oh you're from ucsf do you know jordan and i was like <laughs> do i know jordan <laughs> i don't know what you're talking about jordan who <laughs> and they they asked me part of my interview was like so like if you both got the fellowship spots here do you guys get along <laughs> <laughs> well i can tell them yes you do i can t- if you ever need a backup yes yes you get along great i do love the way that you interact also that's why i was like i wonder if they're you know related or if they've known each other since childhood so it's even more amazing to me that that you you know your friendship is is pretty new in the friendship world, but yet it's it's like you. I think you knew each other in another life or something. I don't. It's it's very <laughs> like fascinating. That. Yeah. So because you two are so interesting and smart and funny and relatable, do you think there's a personality that that fits better in something like a, a focus on forensic pathology, or is it it doesn't really matter? One of the things I kind of like about it is that you really do get a wide range of personality types. Like Hmm. even in Seattle, some of the forensic pathologists are much more introverted and quiet. You know, they do their job and they move on. And other ones are definitely, you know, the younger, more outgoing, willing to do and say whatever it takes. You have the crazy like outfit type of forensic (laughs) pathologists and you also have the very straightforward suit forensic pathologists you have the ones that have all of the desk decorations and you have the ones that just have the one picture of their family you really do get (laughs) very wide range range of personality types everybody has to have at least some kind of morbid fascination with death i think that's like one thing that ties everybody (laughs) together but you do get a wide range of like the extroverted introverted straight lace, a little bit crazy. <laughs> That's kind of interesting. Nice. Yeah, I guess I I guess I want all forensic p- pathologists to be like you two, but I guess that's really that's too much to ask. But it is it is great that you two are hosting the podcast because I will tell you, I don't know of any um straight specific forensic well, there's one other one that I can think of. Um I've started to say pathology podcast, but I was not expecting what I got. I was expecting mm-hmm. something more dry. Um, and maybe traditional. There's there's uh, two two guys who host something called the Double Loop podcast about you know the fingerprints. Oh, and well. it's it's fascinating. Except that they are like two. They're young. I know they're young, but they're like two old men. They're oh. like the the old men in the in the balcony at the Muppet Show. They're just constantly bitching at each other. But you can tell that they love each other and they respect each other. But they're just like Rawr! they're just always bitching, even though it's really fascinating. You know how things have changed in in the fingerprint world. So I love those kind of things too. But hearing you two is really a breath of fresh air and it is relatable to to everyone there isn't anyone who wouldn't hear your podcast you know and understand what what you're talking about you do have a real gift both of you have a very real gift for explaining something that could be very layered and difficult and doing such a a wonderful job of making it accessible 
to everyone. Do either one of you want to, you know, be instructors at any point? Well, yeah, I'm definitely really interested in education. I love it when we have medical students that are rotating through the department. Um, and I would love to work at an office someday where I have residents or fellows coming through. That's awesome. Yeah, I think I'm pretty similar. I am definitely looking forward to uh, sharing the love of forensic pathology and working with residents and fellows and possibly med students coming through. I feel like med students are less common, but definitely I want to work with residents and teach them and pass it on. That's I think both of you would just be, you know, stellar and beloved by anyone who, you know, got to call you, you know, professor or doctor professor or whatever, whatever they would call you. I think that would I think you guys would be stellar. Do you want to stay? Do both of you want to stay in the in the Bay Area? Or do you want to take your magic and go across the country? Because like, didn't Nicole didn't didn't you work like one summer or something in like Vermont? This is Jordan. I'm from New England. Okay. And I did med school in Vermont. Okay. So I spent a lot of time with the, the forensic pathologist in Vermont. And Burlington, Vermont is gorgeous. And it's a really, really nice system. Um, I, since I've moved out here, I've definitely fallen in love with the Bay Area. And sure. I wouldn't mind coming back here. We'll see what happens job prospect wise after fellowship. But I gotcha. definitely wouldn't mind coming back to the Bay. Gotcha. Yeah. And I'm pretty boring. I've been in California my entire life. Um, I was born in Stockton, California, went down to L.A. for undergrad, came back up here for medical school and my MPH. And all of my family is still in the Northern California area. So I don't know that I necessarily want to stay in the Bay Area, but I would like to be close to my my family still and be in California. But well, that's not boring at all. <laughs> That's not at all boring. Yeah, I'm what you like and you stuck with it. <laughs> <laughs> We're stuck with you, which is a gift, I think. <laughs> a total gift. So uh, explain how some, you know, there's medical examiners and there's coroners. And I would use the term interchangeably, but that y- you taught me that's not correct. So explain like board certified as opposed to like, you know, some dude who gets elected who cuts up bodies, you know, in a small town. Yeah, so in the United States, we have the medical examiner systems and the coroner systems. And depending on where you live is how it gets determined which type of system you have. Mm. Um, And a coroner system, uh, as you mentioned, is usually an elected official of some sort. And most of the time, they have very few requirements for that position. It's like, at most, you need to have a high school degree and be able to speak English to a reasonable degree. <laughs> and be able to vote. And be able to vote, yes. Oh, yeah, so you haven't committed a felony. Okay, great. Okay, great. And then sometimes in those systems, uh, it also is some other position. So, like, where I grew up in San Joaquin County, it used to be that the sheriff was automatically the coroner, wow. which, as you might imagine, has um, some issues when it comes to certain kinds of deaths. Um Uh, Luckily, now it's a medical examiner system there, but there are still places where the coroner, the sheriff is automatically the coroner Um, versus a medical examiner system. A medical examiner is an appointed official. um, So the people don't elect them. Some governing body like offers the job position to somebody and that somebody is usually a board certified forensic pathologist. And that board certification just means they have the special specialty training, the fellowship that we're going to be doing um, in forensic pathology, and then they passed their their board's examination. Okay. This is Mark. I have a question. So in, in L.A. County, we have a coroner. Yes. That, okay. Does the coroner hire um, medical examiners? Is that how it works? Or, or the forensic pathologists? Because So, yeah, the coroner will hire forensic pathologists. So you're not a medical examiner unless you're in a medical examiner system but all medical examiners are forensic pathologists okay gotcha so it's kind of like one of those just the names kind of a little crazy so anybody if you're doing an autopsy in the legal medical legal world you are very likely a forensic pathologist right you're either a forensic pathologist that is also a medical examiner in a medical examiner system or you're a forensic pathologist that's hired by a coroner to work in a coroner system. That's interesting. You don't technically have to be a pathologist to do an autopsy. Like there are weird states where <laughs> you can be a doctor and not be a forensic 
not be a pathologist that can do autopsies, but the vast majority of the time, they're a pathologist and almost always a forensic pathologist in the medical legal system. When I was in um, Northern Kentucky and I, I wrote for this little um, little local newspaper and interviewed the um, coroner, <laughs> he was a doctor. And yeah. there I have met other coroners who are um, funeral directors, which I would think would be a weird... A conflict of interest. <laughs> yeah, talk about conflict of interest. I think... It's actually a big thing. Like, I think a lot of... Um, a lot of funeral directors run for coroner. Mm. I think it's not uncommon for coroners to be funeral directors. Interesting. That's but and when I, you look at like the mass casualty thing, so demort, um, a lot of the times funeral directors are part of the group, part of this response because you do need to figure out how to redirect the bodies and that kind of thing. So gotcha. how it's looped in, it's just always interesting, the conflict of interest that it is. people don't always necessarily know about if you don't look into your elected officials before you vote. It yeah. is fascinating. It's it's very fascinating. And I have to tell you, even living you know in LA County, um, the number of times I've had to contact the coroner's office is odd to me. And and basically because I'm I was getting stonewalled by detectives and if if there were remains found and it was someone I knew was missing, I would, you know, call the coroner's office. And I will just tell you the truth. Some of the nicest, kindest people I've ever met are working in the coroner's offices across the country. I've had great experiences in a small town in Indiana and great experiences in L.A. County. And they're just like the kindest people and they don't, you know, they don't give out, you know, because of HIPAA laws, they don't give out um, important information about something. But what they can do is the, a case that that's made me start this podcast is a man who was missing in my area. He's still missing, by the way, but uh, a week and a half ago, the person we know who did something to him was arrested. And that oh, wow. was, yeah, for, that or for something else uh, for that, <laughs> for that. He had had two previous arrests for uh, drugs. And I think he uh, when he injured, probably killed his his relative. I think he thought, OK, third strike. This is going to be bad. And he did something with his body. And yeah. um, it's the thing that propelled me to start this podcast Um because his wife is, I always say, is living my nightmare because she comes home. She works um, in the accounting department of NBC Universal, comes home from work. Uh, the chickens on top of the stove, uh, her husband's cell phone, wallet, keys, jacket are all on the counter and his trucks in the front of the house and he's gone. Wow. wow. And his nephew lied and said he wasn't there all day and then the people across the street said oh you know what we have a security camera that's aimed toward your driveway do you want to see it huh. so yeah sure we do and at 506 <laughs> he backed his suv into the driveway opens up the back hatch so we can't see what happens and at 512 he leaves the driveway going at a high rate of speed in the opposite direction of his home and then denies that he had been at his uncle's home mm -hmm. and then they find uh blood in the back of of the SUV and his uncle is gone. But mm -hmm. I have, you know, we live in Santa Clarita, which is uh, a, a small town in North, you know, not all the way North of LA County. That's the Antelope Valley, but we're between Los Angeles city proper. And, you know, we're like a bedroom community of Los Angeles. And even though it's a, you know, a town of about 250,000 people, Believe it or not, a lot of remains are found here, <laughs> whether it's like, you know, homeless people that have, you know, just succumbed to the elements, which you cover beautifully, by the way, <laughs> um, or, you know, someone's like, who knows what happens, they just are found outside, or whatever. But I have had to call the LA County Coroner's Office on more than one occasion and say, is this is this will, and they will either call me right back, or put me on hold and say, um, those remains, what happened the time I burst into tears is, is someone answered and said, those remains were sent to the state lab. And he called me back five minutes later and said, it's not your guy. Your guy has a whole lot of dental work and this guy didn't. And I burst into tears because he gave me the answer, you know, the, the, the negative answer, which was a positive that it wasn't him, but that yeah. it wasn't him, you know, it, 
so I have I have such a love of medical examiners and coroners, either one and both, because of their compassion for the living who are dealing with the dead. And I think you can hear that in your voices. You're both so um you're both so informed and intelligent, yet you have such great personalities, but you can feel and hear the compassion in your voices. It's so funny that you mentioned that because I know all through medical school when people would ask me, so what specialty are you thinking of going into? And I would say pathology, specifically forensic pathology. They would say, oh, but you're so good at talking to people. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> Like what most people don't realize is that when you are investigating death, you have to do a lot of talking to people and not just people in your field, but grieving families. So you have to have that level of compassion and empathy and ability to connect with people. And you and you both do beautifully. I mean, I'm guessing there's a lot of, um, I don't know, reports that you have to do after you do an autopsy. Like how like how many autopsies during your residency do you do a day is it like one or do you ever have like a a day where you have multiples and you don't you know it's a lot of work so in residency for pathology so we do anatom we're doing anatomic and clinical pathology so throughout those four years per the the graduation medical requirements you need to do at least 50 autopsies so most people do the bare minimum (laughs) <laughs> and of those 50 autopsies spread out over four years, you're really not going to be doing daily autopsies, obviously. Right. Okay. Um, at UCSF anyway, you have one month at UCSF when you're doing all the autopsies that come through UCSF itself. And usually in that month you get, I think on average, it's like 12 to 15 autopsies. Okay. And then when you go to the VA or SF General Hospital, who, whatever residents are there, they kind of rotate and take turns doing the autopsies, but there aren't that many autopsies there either. So you get like two to three a month at the general and the VA gets very few autopsies. Yeah, gotcha. And then you do a month with the forensic pathologist. And that's the month when you really get to see and do a lot of autopsies, but you do less report writing. So you do all of the report writing at the university and at the general in the VA. Like you're writing up the entire autopsy report. But at the medical examiner's office, obviously they need to, the forensic pathologist needs to have the final say in everything because they're the ones that are gonna have to testify in court. They're the ones that are gonna have to talk to the family. Right. Um, I've written up a couple of like the prelim autopsy reports and then given it to the forensic pathologist to you know edit and finalize. But most of the time, when you rotate through the medical examiner, you participate in the autopsy, but you don't really take too much part in report writing. Okay. So I would say that most residents that go through anatomic and clinical pathology residency will do 50 autopsies, write up 50 autopsy reports over four years and be done. Okay. Um, We obviously are more interested, so we do more. Yeah. (laughs) Right. Um, So like next month, I'll be going to the medical examiner. So the entire month of September, I'll be there and I'll probably do like, well, as many as they'll let me like take part in a couple autopsies a day, maybe write up one report a day. Wow. Which is significantly less than an actual forensic pathologist does. Um, But, and then I will not have to do the extra stuff, right? I'm not going to have to talk to lawyers. I'm not going to have to go testify in court. I'm not going to have to do all the ancillary stuff. Um, Which is interesting. I hadn't thought about that. How often are forensic pathologists, you know, asked to testify in court? I would say once you're set up, it's probably about once a month you're going to have to go to court. Yeah. Wow. Um, Maybe a little bit more. And they try to get us experience with testifying during fellowship, but fellowship is only a year long, and it takes so long for cases to go to court most of the time. That case that you maybe did the autopsy on will have been handed off to somebody else, and they'll be the ones testifying. So that would be yeah. There are times that like if there's an early autopsy, maybe you know the end of the year you might get to go. But I think it's the vast minority of the time you'll get to do anything before being a fully grown up and adult doctor. (laughs) (laughs) So tell me what your fellowship next year in Seattle. What does that entail? Um, So we will be working at the King County Medical Examiner's Office, which up in Seattle, it's part of the Public Health Department. Um, And so 
basically will be assigned cases every day and in the morning we'll be performing the autopsy and then in the afternoon we'll be doing our ancillary testing, our, our follow-ups, writing our reports, um, and maybe going to scenes. Um, we'll be on call uh, one week every month. And so during that time, if for any reason a medical examiner is needed to come out on scene, um, then we will get paged and we will have to go no matter what time of day it is. Um, and you will uh, wear high and, heels. <laughs> yeah, yeah, in our high heels. <laughs> <laughs> um, and... Uh, I think they do some rotations where we'll spend some time in the toxicology lab. Um, they had a forensic anthropologist w that you spent, I think, a month with. Mm. Um, I'm not sure if that's still a rotation that they have. The weird thing about pathology right now is that for fellowships, that subspecialty training, there's no standardized application system so we actually found out we were going to be going to seattle two years ahead of time and so much can change in two years wow. um that this is the information that we got at our interview day but which was over a year ago now yeah. wow <laughs> yeah. like we interviewed essentially two and a half years before our job would start wow. which i remember going to the interview and i stayed with some friends in seattle and Megan asked me, oh, is this to start like this July? And I was like, no, this is for the July two years from now. Wow. And she, her mouth literally dropped open. <laughs> she was yeah. like, <laughs> nowhere in no planning. other industry do you plan for a job more than two years ahead of time. No kidding. I mean, that's <laughs> that lends itself to, you know, how much planning and preparation it entails, but also the fact that they don't think that the industry is going to be changing that much. If in two <laughs> years you're going to be going to school, learning the same things. I mean, that's like, that is fascinating. And I can't tell you how excited I am that you're both going to Seattle because honestly, that's like the home of the most fascinating serial killers ever. <laughs> it's like, there's, <laughs> there's so much shit that goes down in the Pacific Northwest. I think it's going to be, a really fascinating year for each of you. I think it's going to be. We have lots really... of fodder for the podcast. Too. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. As if you have. I mean, that's something I just adore about you is that both of your minds are so open, and the things that you talk about on the podcast are so, you know, d such different um, topics that I just would not think would lend itself to. You know, I guess I just think of it as you're in you're in a lab or you're in an exam room and it's you're just around a bunch of dead people and it's so not <laughs> that it's so much more than that and i will i will tell you that i uh you know thought a little bit about going to mortuary science school because in cincinnati right like in the area where i'm from it has a really great reputation the cincinnati school of mortuary science was one of the first uh schools for mortuary science along you know Everyone thinks Ohio is in the Midwest. It's really not. It's one state away from the Atlantic, you know, and it's kind of the East Coast. So this the Cincinnati School of Mortuary Sciences has a great um, reputation along the entire eastern seaboard. And I thought about it started in the 1800s. I thought about going to school there, but I realized I can't handle grief. Like I can't process my own grief. So as much as I loved the idea of going, I knew if there were grieving families and I worked at a funeral home, they would like fire me immediately because I'd be crying too, along with the families. I, I couldn't possibly, you know, be, um, you know, step out of myself and, and be and be there for somebody else because I'd be sobbing my eyeballs out. So yeah, that's definitely something that I know that people have asked me, like, how can you work in this death field and not be sad all the time? And it always just comes back to like, you know, we're doing it to help closure for the families. Yeah. And then to maybe put somebody away that did something horrible to another human. Yeah. And maybe find ways of helping to prevent death in other people. Exactly. Absolutely. I mean, it's it's so fascinating to think that I had never, it just, it really like was a thunderbolt when I heard, you know, pathology is the foundation of all medicine. And I was like, oh my God, that certainly makes all the sense in the world that, to find out how things work when we're still moving and living, it's a really great education to find out so, what happens when we're not. 
So what my grand, as I said, my grandfather was a pathologist, and one of the things he always said growing up was pathologists are the doctor's doctor. Like mm. the doctor doesn't necessarily know what's going on, so they get lab tests, they get a biopsy, they ask a question, and then pathologists don't really see patients. Like there are there's right. a few specialties that you do, right? The vast majority of pathologists, our patients are the doctors. Our patients wow. are the doctors question so they come to you with like this clinical scenario or this biopsy or this tumor resection and they're like please tell me what's going on and help us and so we then go and the doctors are our patients so we might not be communicating to the patients but we're talking communicating to the doctors about their patients so they can then go and give that information so. i love that your grandfather said pathologists are the doctors doctors that is that's the best description ever <laughs> I can tell you we had um, a guest who is an ER doc in San Diego, and he is a toxicologist. Okay. And he fucking figured out a huge mystery of an asshole who's tried to tries tried to poison his wife with thallium. Mm, okay. And he figured it out that you know the the woman was had been hospitalized as you can imagine numerous times in the past and they he her husband was in the military so he'd take her to different hospitals so that they no one would communicate <laughs> figure yeah. out that he was poisoning her over time and this doctor who's just a badass you know um the er doc said will you take a look at this for me and he's like uh yeah we're gonna put her in a room no one from her family sees her nothing goes in and i'm she's being poisoned and he figured it out so you guys are you know you are the doctors doctors and you know it you are doing you know i don't want to say you're doing god's work but you're doing god's work you're doing <laughs> you're it's amazing what you're doing i am so like um happy for the future knowing that you two girls are there i just i really you know i just, i know i'm like putting a lot of pressure on you <laughs> <laughs> but don't let me down because you're you're amazing <laughs> girls. I totally adore you. Is there anything you want listeners to this podcast to know about about you, what you do and your podcast? Oh, that's a good question. <laughs> um, I think the main thing is just if you have weird random questions about forensics and autopsies and that kind of thing, just shoot them our way. As you said, like we have expanded on a lot of topics, but we're slowly running out. <laughs> and if people have questions, we would love to be able to address certain things that people are still wondering about. So, you know. The good thing is people are always going to be dying. So, you know, you may not, <laughs> you're not going to run out of topics. I promise you're going to. Yeah, no, somebody at some point was talking about how, you know, they needed more data to keep people alive. And I made the joke that, well, the more people that die, the more data I get. <laughs> Yeah, see, you're, you know, I always think it's so interesting to be in the death business. And it's not really a business, but it is kind of. It's a, We're it's a have science. Jobs. It's a, right. It's an art and a science and a business. And yeah, people are always going to be dying. So you're always going to have jobs. And we will absolutely have your email address because I know it's like a submission form that people can send, you know, for information or questions they have about the podcast or about. Yeah, they can also just email the email address directly. Yeah, exactly. Well, I just I just want you both to know I adore you and I, I hope that some people that, you know, listen to this podcast and are complete murder nerds like me are going to find your podcast if they haven't already. And I, I know they're going to love it as much as I do. Yeah. And thank you for being here, even as George is tearing you up. <laughs> <laughs> just just a flesh wound. Yeah. <laughs> You're the black knight. <laughs> it's a flesh wound. <laughs> Thank you so much, girls. Thank you. Thank you for having us. Thank you so much to Jordan and Nicole for talking with us today. And you are just fascinating, wonderful girls. And I know you're going to bring an interest in forensic pathology to a lot of other listeners. I know you are. I learned a lot. I, I am fascinated by the body and I'm even fascinated, more fascinated by these girls because the way they explain what happens before and after we well, yeah. shuffle off the mortal coil. But, but also things like, you know, the difference between a coroner, a medical examiner, yeah. a forensic pathologist, all that stuff is, you know. It, it's something we need to know. And, and every state is different. So you never know what's going on in your state. But it's it's uh, an interesting thing. And I, I hope you enjoyed the interview. They have this great podcast you can find anywhere that you cast your pods. 
um, Apple, Spotify, any place. It's Dead Men Do Tell Tales. They have a case submission form on uh, any of their accounts. You can, I think it's Twitter. They're on Twitter, um, Facebook, probably Instagram also. But you can send in any questions you have. You can send in any ideas for a case that they can cover. They are open to hearing from you and they have great listeners with great ideas and a great podcast. So I hope you'll check it out and more cowbell. And remember, if you'd like to support this podcast, go to patreon.com forward slash just the tipsters. 